I swear, and the highest honor I can muster, that everything in this story is true, related as lucidly as possible. All true, no matter how badly I wish it wasn't. There isn't much to do in the rural parts of Pennsylvania, what some call Pennsylvania. Like most parts of rural America, popular pastimes include drinking oneself into a stupor and driving unexpectedly 1983 Ford F-150s, double the speed limit down narrow, rarely maintained roads. I, however, occupy myself, when I can, by hunting. It gets a bad rap as a barbaric, cruel practice, but I've always found solace in the forest that is impossible to find in the cramped, too close for comfort atmosphere of a small town. This particular season, I was out in early November in a forest in the foothills of the Appalachians, a few minutes away from my home northwest of Harrisburg. It was late in the fall season, and the steady flow of foliage tourists, what locals call leaf peepers, was beginning to trickle to a stop. Some trees were still burning a fiery red orange, but most were beginning to wither, foreshadowing an unusually harsh winter. The falling leaves created a curtain of decay which moved like a sandstorm in slow motion, shrouding and isolating me from my surroundings and crunching softly under every footstep. I paced my way through the temple of red and gold, alert for the light footsteps of my quarry, white-tailed deer. My Winchester 3006 swayed on my back as I walked. The gun was overkill for a deer, but it doesn't pay to take chances around bigger game like elk and black bear. This forest was new territory for me. A refreshing change of pace after paved trails and subdivisions began to encircle the hunting grounds of my childhood. As I walked, I began to lighten my guard, losing focus on the wildlife and becoming engrossed in the natural beauty of the area. I became so distracted, peering up at the falling leaves, that I tripped over a tree root, snaking through the carpet. I followed it with my eye to its termination at the base of a massive, gnarled oak tree. The trunk was huge, but the tree was squat, blackened with age, and split down the middle as if by an act of God. This story could have ended then and there, if not for a smell that wafted up to me as I passed the tree. It wound its way up from the tree's base, out of a swale in the ground, to the raised path I was walking on, pushing the crisp smell of the forest aside. My first thought was that of a dead animal, which could mean a bear in the area, so I circled the tree to take a look. There was no carcass, but the scene at the base of the tree resembled a homicide. Dark, matted clumps of fur dotted the undergrowth, and a viscous black fluid led from the forest into a hollow overshadowed by a titanic root leading deep into the ground. The entire picture was punctuated by the small rank smell, a thick, coppery scent like pennies mixed with death. I am not unused to gritty, even downright disturbing scenes. But this scent made me wretch involuntarily, and the den unsettled me deeply, as though I had stumbled upon something no one should ever see. Shaken, I moved back onto the trail, and, against my better judgement, resumed my search for a deer. The sun began to beat down overhead with all the clarity of a winter's day shining a demanding light under the forest and weakening my resolve. I had just began to unpack my lunch when something began to bother me. I couldn't put a finger on what it was, but I felt antsy, for lack of a better word, like I shouldn't be sitting still. Without even knowing it, I began to scan my surroundings for something anything. I was returning to my lunch when it hit me. The forest 
was silent. No birds chirping, no insects buzzing. Even the rustle of trees in the wind had come to an ominous standstill. As the meaning of this realization began to sink in and I got to my feet, two things happened in rapid succession. A sizable branch snapped a few hundred meters away and an ungodly screech penetrated the November air. I have never heard a sound like it before or since. It was as though the earth itself split and hell opened up, just long enough to sum up the suffering of the damned in one ear-splitting roar. Terrified, I bolted to my gun, leaned against the tree and began to scan the undergrowth. Something big was moving through the forest floor, but I couldn't see what it was thanks to the curtain of leaves falling around me. I hastily made tracks back in the direction I had come, forcing myself not to look back. After all, what animal would actively stalk a human without even being provoked? I had lost the sound of the creature and began to loosen up a little when I was hit with a bone-chilling realization. The sounds of the forest had come back behind me, but, but the trees in front were as silent of the grave. Whatever I had encountered, probably the same beast that had made the mess under the oak tree, had circled back in an attempt to trap me. Truly scared at this point, I scrambled off the path into a rock gully, my back to a damp rock wall. I crawled without taking my eyes off the path into a cave, hoping to hide my hyperventilation and chattering teeth from whatever was stalking me. Only a few minutes had passed when I heard the crunch of leaves and a deep, demonic snorting. It stopped on the path above my hideaway, and I held my breath, willing my heart to stop so as to be completely silent. The creature had begun to move on when my gun, leaning against the rock, slipped off the slick surface. It clattered to the ground, reverberating louder than an air raid siren in the crisp autumn air. My heart sank as I heard steps make their way down the rocks and closer to me. I crawled painfully slowly towards my rifle, every muscle in my body tight enough to burst. I stopped to steady myself and heard breathing right outside the cave opening. It was choked, slavering breathing, unnatural breathing, which inspired visualizations of twisted corruptions of human and beast, a patchwork demon of animal and man. I reached for my gun and came the closest to death I ever have because I outstretched my hand, so did it. Instead of the smooth shellac of my rifle stock, my palm met a coarse, ragged fur, caked with mud and attached to a lanky, sinewy arm. The beast screamed, and as I shouldered my rifle and fired blindly out of the opening, I caught a glimpse of yellowed fang and one blood-red eye an eye that reflected a hatred more ancient than man. A hatred that said, this is my forest. You may have altered it through your presence, corrupted it, but I was here before you, and I will be here after. Human willpower paled in the face of such uncompromising malice, and I shrank back against the rocks, robotically cycling bullets out of the cave. I sat there, dead-eyed, doing this for a long time, overnight and well into the next morning, over 18 hours of working a bolt and pulling the trigger. By the time I snapped out of my adrenaline fueled haze, my mouth felt like a desert and my fingers felt as though they were made out of canvas stretched over dust. Shaking, I reached for my water bottle and gulped it down, spilling most of it down my front praying the beast was long gone, I inched my way out of the cave and ran 
as fast as my rickety legs would carry me the two odd miles back to my truck, leaving most of my gear behind. Nothing pursued me, but the feeling of being hunted remained. I drove back to town 80 miles per hour on a dirt road, my eyes wide with fear and my hands gripping the wheel with white knuckles. Unable to bear the thoughts of my secluded home, I spent the night at a motel in town with a bottle of cheap whiskey and every light in the room turned on. The thought of the creature would not exit my mind. Was it a demon, loosed on the earth by some divine mistake? Or just an animal, a cryptid lost to time and the memories of the trees? I didn't really want to know, but I couldn't, and still can't, let it go. The fear eventually subsided, but as I sit at home, thinking about this, I swear, hand to God, that I can hear a howl echo through the trees and across the mountains, telling me that I may never rest, never forget.